Welcome. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. We are thrilled to have all of you here. While the pandemic has brought about many unforeseen and unwelcome changes, we are hopeful that at least some good will come out of this in terms of building new skills and ways to engage with our students, no matter what the platform is. So thank you again for being here. My name is Glenna Barlow. I work in the Education and Engagement Department here at the Columbia Museum of Art in Columbia, South Carolina. So thanks to everyone joining from near and far. Before we begin, I want to extend our gratitude particularly to Colonial Life, who are our sponsors for this program. And they are really dedicated to championing educational initiatives and they really enthusiastically supported this talk along with two others that we offered one last week and one that's coming up on Thursday. Uh, we just could not offer up these kinds of educational programs without the support of our sponsors and members. So we wanted to thank them. So for those of you who may not be familiar with us, the Columbia Museum of Art is dedicated to serving as a resource for educators. And we have a particular mind towards visual literacy and arts integration across the curriculum. But we know that in this particular moment, things are changing rapidly, especially in the world of education. And we are trying to work to meet the needs of the teachers in our state, but also beyond. So um, to that end, we've organized a few panel discussions. This is one of them. Um, and we'll have another one on virtual learning and kind of sustaining that engagement on Thursday. Um, that one will have some, some tech experts as well. So we'll get some good nuts and bolts kind of um, usable information, I hope. Um, I hope you'll consider joining us then, um, but you can find information about that panel discussion as well as our other resources at columbiamuseum.org slash learn. So we've got a lot more for you on there. And we're actually working right now on a menu of virtual options that uh, we hope will help you to infuse art in your classroom throughout the year. So stay tuned for more about that. All right, now on to the main event. Thank you all again for being here today. And especially uh, thank you to our panelists who have agreed to join us and speak on these really timely and important topics. So thank you all. I wanna begin by just saying that we are diving into a pretty broad subject. Um, we recognize that there are a lot of different facets to virtual and uh, digital instruction. So we're gonna to attempt to address as many of these different issues as we can, but we understand that these conversations um, can and should continue on beyond past this uh, discussion. So we invite you to use our hashtag we've uh, invented. It's hashtag kickstart virtual art. Um, you can use your social media platforms to kind of keep the conversation going and ask questions and share ideas. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of resource that are all, resources that are already out there. So we've compiled just some of them, uh, ranging from tutorials to apps to online museum collections. And those um, are, are all collected in our Google Doc that we sent out to our registrants. We'll also drop the link to that in our chat. Um, so you can reference that throughout the talk, but you'll have that available to you after as well. If you have your own recommendations, feel free to add those in. It's, that's what it's there for. Um, whether you've been teaching online for years or you're just getting started, we really hope that you will come away from this talk feeling energized and with some new ideas to inject into your virtual classrooms. Um, I myself am no technology expert. I am here to learn too. So I'm really just here to facilitate. I've got my pen ready to take lots of notes and um, you're going to hear a lot more from our, our panelists than you will from me. We are gonna to attempt to address the questions that you've identified when you registered, but hopefully we'll have some time to answer your questions that pop up throughout. So do drop those in the chat or you can put them directly into the Google Doc at the very bottom. All right, and with all of the housekeeping done, um, we, it, well, it's my pleasure today to um, introduce our four panelists. We have a very impressive group here and they have many accolades and credentials between them. So if I read them all to you, we would probably be here about half an hour. <laughs> so instead, I'll just ask them to briefly introduce themselves um, and just give you a snapshot of their work and experience when it comes to virtual instruction. So um, Dr. Eunjun Chang, can you lead us off? Yeah, I'm Dr. Eunjun Chang. I'm teaching in Francis Marion University uh, in Art Education Program. Uh, it's in South Carolina. I have been teaching there for uh, 13 years, and my research is focused on museum education, STEAM, and integration curriculum, and multicultural education. Nice Wonderful. to meet you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, Sherry Duncan, can you introduce yourself to us, please? I'm Sherry Duncan, and I'm a visual arts teacher at a public uh, middle school 
and I've been teaching for about 15 years. I'm nationally board certified and I just finished my master's. So I'm excited about that. And this is our first year to be a middle school exactly, or really. We've been doing fifth and sixth grade only for the last, oh, 18, 20 years. So I'm glad to be here today. And we are a STEAM certified school from Advanced Ed. So that's a really cool thing to have. Great, thank you, Sherry. All right, Alice Gentilly, would you give us an introduction, please? Hi, um, I'm Alice Gentilly and I am a um, an art teacher in central Massachusetts to students in grades fifth and sixth. Um, I'm also uh, certified in instructional technology and STEAM curriculum development. So I try to blend all of that into my curriculum, um, teaching these fantastic kids. Thank you for coming today. It's, um, it's gonna be great to see everybody. Great, thank you. And Dr. Hyunji Kwan. Hi, um, my name is Hyunji Kwan and I'm teaching art education at the University of South Carolina, which is in Columbia, South Carolina. And I've been teaching several online courses, including studio art courses, drawing courses, and non-art related courses, as well as um, art history slash art appreciation course as well. Great, thank you so much. Okay, well, we are going to dive in and we thought it might be best to start off with just some of the nuts and bolts and uh, what are the, the programs and the platforms that you have found that really work best and have um, been the most faithful in terms of adapting and um, sustaining your students' engagement. So to do that, um, we do have some images we wanna share with all of you. So I will share that image um, and we're gonna get started right now. All right. So to kick us off, I'm going to turn it over to Alice. This is, um, this is a screenshot of my classes from the spring. Um, I typically have nine, nine art classes. And then I also have a Google Classroom for Art Club. Um, I found I've worked with Canvas um, through Harvard Graduate School. I've been a facilitator for that program and I like Canvas a lot. I find Google Classroom to be super helpful with the younger set. So I work with kids who are 10 through 12. And um, this, it, especially because across my district, we're one-to-one -one iPad um, district. We were previously for grades five through 12. As of this year, as we return in a hybrid model, all students will have iPads. So students have had exposure to Google Classroom and it's become, because we're all joined in using the same learning management system, students are familiar with it, they know the ins and outs, and you don't have that to sort of get over um, before you start the year. So I highly recommend Google Classroom if you have that availability. And I'm gonna say the same thing that we use Google Classroom too because um, we are one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. And this is just a page off of one of my e-learning pages from um, this last spring. And we use the Zoom format for Meets and we use Google Meets and we use Screencastify to record lessons. Like um, every day I needed to record about a five minute lesson to start the day off with them. So I did that. And um, then I had the meets with them afterwards. So in case they had questions. And this summer during my master's program, my professor used a, his personal YouTube channel, not going out to everybody, but just for me and critiqued my work. And that sparked an idea in my mind that a personal critique would be a really helpful thing because it's easier than just writing something on the rubric or something like that. They might like to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to be working that into mine too. And before we move on, I had a quick question that jumped up in the Q&A, uh, which was how do you incorporate Google Classroom into Canvas? So Alice, maybe could you speak about that briefly and what that looks like? How would you incorporate Google Classroom into Canvas? Just right off the bat, I would say, I don't know why you would do that. <laughs> And, I mean, they're each, they're each learning management systems. And um, unless, you are, unless you're teaching art education and you want to instruct 
um, pre-service teachers how to use Google Classroom, I think you would choose one or the other. Okay, so they're just sort of separate programs that you might use um, in tandem, but not integrated. Yeah. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, the, the one that was a slide just before that was just the listing of what is um, on Google Education, Google for Education. And they have a variety of lesson plans that you can pick to have in case you need something. So that Google for Education, which is also a part of the Google Classroom is very helpful. So this is just a picture of my kids in my classroom. And as you can see, we had lots of um, teamwork and collaboration and this year we're gonna have one kid at a table. So that's gonna be the difference. And um, their collaboration will be over their Chromebooks instead of face-to-face. -face. Sorry about that. That's okay, it. here I'm going to focus on a little higher education because a lot of university use Blackboard. It's the also a uh, learning uh, tool for many college. Right, this uh, screenshot is nine now during the summer and today too, I'm teaching summer course. And then I design, as you can see the left side, syllabus and weekly class and final exam and class dialogue. What's great about Blackboard is the easy communication with the student because you can do announce and then uh, there are tasks, what you knew and need attention and to do and also if you have they need the deadline, you can send the uh, warning, right? So it's the good uh, system for uh, especially uh, class management and announcement of students. And also, uh, can you move to the next slide? Sure. Uh, this one is I would like to share is my one lesson. I think I usually give a guideline what we are going to do because this one is art appreciation course. So you can see that I uh, put the uh, time period to the artist and then it, if they open this folder, I usually combine the textbook reading. I think theory part is also important making the part, right? So I uh, put the textbook usually one to paste. If there is no need textbook, I put my uh, little article related to the artist. And then I made a PowerPoint, but usually no more than uh, six slides because I think the six or five slide is enough. And then I put through a uh, minimum two image and maximum three, it's six image. That's the uh, important to know. And then as you can see that uh, assignment, right? And then I make, because I'm not sure whether or they read everything and they study everything. So I made some question, textbook, video one, video two, and PowerPoint after study and then what do they think about the reflection? So that's the one day assignment for a uh, student. If I uh, the focus on the artist introduction. Okay, so our university also uses the Blackboard, but this is Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. So I think it's a very similar, but a little bit more advanced version. Um, this is my class, and then as you can see on the left side, I have all um, structures out, and then this is really structured for students, self-directed learning. So from start here, course information and about your professor, so they just need to click um, each step, right? And then um, the, in, the, in the middle, you can see my module. So that's the order of modules. So when you click each module, you can see the right side. So uh, like in just class, I have overview and then um, introduction line and shape, but then each fo folder, I also have my lecture and um, like quiz and demonstration video. Um, images of artworks and other things. So it is pretty much like step by step for my student. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Yeah. So the I think the difference between Blackboard and the Blackboard Blackboard Collaborate Ultra is the lecture function. I I, I think so. When you use this lecture function, you can easily record your lecture by by um, going through your slides. So what I just did is that I put my PowerPoint first, and then um, I 
recorded my lecture there and then um, I can just upload it. So it's really easy to record my lecture and upload it and students can watch it at any time they want, right? So it's quite similar to the YouTube. The difference between YouTube and Blackboard Collaborate Ultra is that YouTube, it, it takes a lot of time to process and then compress the file, whereas Blackboard Ultra is just immediate to upload your lecture. And you can also download the original file too. Uh, but then YouTube has a closed the captioning, but then the Ultra, this Blackboard Ultra does not have a close the captioning. So that the bad part is that someone has to type the lecture and they put it underneath it. So, I mean, I had someone's help who, uh, who did it, but if you have no help, like it's really not necessary, I feel like. Yeah, no, oh, great ideas. Um, so it sounds like uh, Google Classroom, Canvas, and Blackboard all have um, great options for teaching depending on which level you're at. Mm -hmm. I, I heard a really great tip today as well somewhere um, that if you are trying to find a way to pre-record a lecture and you don't maybe have as many tools as your disposal, you can use Zoom and just have a meeting with yourself mm -hmm. and um, have a PowerPoint right. to follow along right. with. You can record yeah. it. And I think it can make, it'll make a transcript for you if you have that um, setting. Um, and it's actually very similar to the Ultra I used. So I just opened a meeting for my, for, for my, by myself and then, you know, I just recorded a lecture. But you can do the same function uh, by opening the class to your students so they can join and then you can give us the same lecture. You know what I mean? But I just recorded a load so that they can just do it on their pace. So yeah. you can do it kind of um, live or um, pre-recorded. Right. Yeah. Great. All right. Okay, so this is a, a really important topic that we wanted to make sure to cover um, early on. Um, you know, this goes right along with some of the discussions we had last week, last week around, you know, building um, safe and brave spaces for our students, making sure they feel welcome and included, um, and, you know, having some difficult conversations sometimes. And it's just that much harder to do that when you're not in a physical space with your students. So we wanted to spend some time really thinking about how do you create a community with your um, with your students when you're not all in the same space when you have to rely on a virtual platform, especially um, since this year we're really starting the year this way. So these will be brand new students for many teachers. Um, so if we can just spend some time thinking about how to make sure our students really feel welcome in these spaces. Um, I think that'll be uh, a great help to many teachers out there. So um, Alice, if you could have Sure. Um, before I speak about that, though, I, I, I wanted to cycle back a little to what you were saying about a meeting of one in Zoom where you could record it. Um, and I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but you can also do that with Google Meet for people who are using the Google platform. Okay. So moving on, though, to um, creating these welcoming virtual environments. Um, when we were released, we were released on March 13th, and it was all very sudden. Even teachers only had about an hour's notice. So immediately with my younger set, ages 10 through 12, there was an, at first an immediate sense of joy that they didn't have to go to school for two weeks, not understanding that this would then turn into the, an entire prolonged period of virtual study. Um, so within the first week or two, I started... Um, reaching out to them via Google Classroom and asking them to respond to a prompt. In this case, it's just the cover for a video on um, what, what are you doing outdoors? You know, like we're also trying to encourage them for a healthy lifestyle to be outdoors and not be all day looking at their iPads. So I would send out the prompt. They would reply with a photo or short video no longer than 20 seconds. And then I would com compile them using the app in Emoto. I would just upload all of that content and create a video. I would then post it up on YouTube, unlisted to protect their privacy, and um, then share it out through Google Classroom so everybody had a sense of what everybody else was up to. Um, and this was a great way to build community when we, when we had first been released because we weren't yet doing live instruction over Zoom. That came after about three weeks. And then at that point, we were able to share the videos and go over them together and enjoy them just as a, a group of students and myself. And we would just enjoy looking at them. And um, so I, I recommend something like that. It worked really well for my kids. Great. Thank you. I love that idea. 
And we did something very similar to Alice's that we had a Google form that they had a wellness check that they would check in every day when they started and they would just click on one of the little icons and tell us how they're doing that day. And at the bottom, there was a short answer part where they wanted to share what was going on and the reason they picked a, per a particular um, icon they could. But basically just so that you could look real quick and you pull it up on your Google form and you can get a graphic that tells you what the temperature of the room is real fast. And that worked really well. And it opened conversations. And that was the most important part of it, was opening those conversations. With me starting back with um, being in the classroom, but the kids being virtual every other day, I'm going to use something like this to also make sure I check on them on the days that they're home. Great. And I love that this has that option for, that could probably be used for younger students as well, since it's you know not so text reliant. Well, this is my fifth and sixth grade level. Yeah. Right. This seems like it, you could adapt it, uh, which is really, really nice. Um, all right. The other thing that I do with the kids is develop a guidelines for how they critique other artworks when they're in the room. And this helps to build community. And um, letting them critique each other's artworks, I think, is a very valuable lesson. So we use these three statements to start with things. I like, I wish, I wonder, or what if. And when they start with those, it keeps a nice flow to the conversation so that they're being positive about what they say back and forth to each other. And we use this on a form in our Google Classrooms. So it would say, um, I liked um, the way the shading was done on the apple, you know, on so-and-so's artwork. So we would do something like that. And these I like, I wish, I wonder are our feedback statements that we use all the time in our STEAM, in our STEAM education. So they're very familiar with it. So with this new year, it'll be very important to jump in right at the first day or two and teach them how to do that. Great. Yeah, I love these three. Oh, Andrew, you're muted. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, so uh, my class is a little different because I'm teaching 100 students. So um, to make class more engaging, I usually introduce myself. So there is a tab on the left about your professor there. So when they click it, they can see my photo and then uh, my voice, you know, talking about myself. And as you see, my name is really hard to pronounce. So start from how to pronounce it and then uh, just little things about myself. And then also um, on the syllabus, I emphasize many times the um, that the language is very important so that they have to use respectful language and attitude. If not, you know, the class wouldn't be as inclusive, right? So I emphasize that one. And then um, next slide, please. So um, this is about how to make class, class very engaging and responsive. So this class, uh, like other teachers, I do a lot of self-exploration and self-expression type of arts, right? Um, but because I'm an immigrant and woman of color and Asian, I'm not really, um, I don't belong to the majority demographics of teachers. So whenever I demonstrate art artwork, I usually talk about myself a lot. And um, for example, like this one that you're looking at, this is about the collage about power and powerless. So whenever I do the powerless part, as you can see on the left side, I do the frame and then the chain in my mouth, right? So I'm framed as such, and then uh, sometimes my language is a barrier, and I feel like it's an obstacle to communicate with others. So the point is that it is the um, the art making demonstration video, but really about myself, and then I really make my artwork uh, about me, down to earth, and being really honest and true to my struggles a lot. And then uh, my students' works seem to respond to that. So they also tend to be very um, engaging and so also very responsive and then uh, talk deeply about themselves without really offending others. So I think that's one of the uh, subtle strategy I'm using in my classroom. Oh, I love that openness and um, that sense of honesty and really just modeling that kind of um, behavior. That's great. 
Yeah, this one is the, uh, my, my case, the how I can make a sense of community. I, as you can see, left side, I made a class dialogue. And then usually uh, during summer, uh, my student size is okay. I have 20 students, but usually I have more than 55 students. But uh, so we introduce each other. So as you can see, the, I made the uh, room to introduce you to class. Right. So one student introduced about good morning professor and peer, and then he explained about a little bit about himself. And I try to make every response right after I lead their introduction. And then he mentioned about he wants to be FBI agents and he loves full marathon and it's his first class. And then I give a very, you know, short comment. And then he also respond like, thanks, professor. Something like, you know, I think even though we offer very great lesson, students complain. I'm not sure what they are doing because they are not response. Teacher are not response. So I give uh, in my syllabus, I give a 24 hour response, right? Because I cannot sometimes, you know, response to everything. So, uh, but I respond any student email in 24 hours. So you can uh, put that one is important. And next slide. And also, I think it's very important when you teach many different students in one classroom and there are others, right? And then uh, because they are very free, their communication. So in our school, we have online communication etiquette and we call netiquette. So uh, we have, you know, 11, right? So I usually mention in syllabus at the beginning of the semester. So they know what they should not do in the classroom. Right, and next slide. There we go. And uh, first two example is the uh, for a bigger size class because they have a lot of students. Sometimes I cannot really have the time for all students to individually. And this one is my pre-service teacher major class. We have around 10 some students. And this one is our introduction activity. Instead, they introduce about who they are. They introduce my past, present, future. It's more like their goal. And because I believe if they have happy you know, mind, they can make a happy classroom. So I combine for this one, my past, present, future together, and they make a collage. And then they share this one. And next one is also another collage. It's, it's photo montage activity. Next slide. This one is also one of the way they can introduce. Actually, as you can see the right side, my sons, I think teacher, they assign to share one picture every year. So this one is at the third grade or something activity. I got an idea that what about I share with my student a good bad characteristic they introduce because they are going to be teacher. So I use many different format to introduce the classroom. And this one is simply they can do in home, even though we uh, use a virtual, you know, classroom. Great. Yeah, I love the idea of kind of um, leveraging whatever you have available. So whether it's an online platform or, you know, if your students are at home, you can use um, what they have available to kind of introduce themselves to your, um, their other students maybe. Um, so yeah, just getting creative with how we kind of introduce ourselves and set the tone for the year. All right. Um, and so this is a related question, I think, but how do you engage in, um, diff in, you know, conversations that can be difficult or just, um, challenging when you're not, you know, in the same room together face to face? So this is my class again. So my class used to be a traditional lecture course on art history slash art appreciation. So when I did that, there was a really small room to really discuss contemporary art with a lot of conceptually you know, deep work. So what I did is that I completely redeveloped the course by the themes. So as you can see uh, from spirituality to the body. So what I did is that I put uh, in each theme, I put um, art history and then um, contemporary art that deals with that theme. 
And by doing that in each uh, module, I can touch a little bit of art history as well as contemporary art, right? By doing that, I could include a lot of um, contemporary artists, of course, including a non-Western contemporary artists whose works um, can often be very provocative and then thought provoking. Um, I found it really useful because I could include a lot of um, artists of color and the feminist artists uh, throughout the theme, not just under one or two themes. And then um, when I included those artists and explained their work, of course, I emphasize how critical they are, how socioculturally related their works are. And then when my students um, have to write a research paper, they also need to p uh, pick one theme and then uh, develop a research paper about the theme. So when, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, happened recently again, a lot of students, you know, chose the theme of power and then uh, the artist that artists whose work is about the power and then develop their paper. So I think this is a nice way to um, sort of sort of like include those artists just throughout the semester uh, without really um, without really like bluntly um, bringing bringing out the terms like racism and feminism because I use their art, their works just throughout the semester no matter what. Great. I love this as a way to be inclusive and the notion of themes is a great way to, um, you know, be able to incorporate more artists throughout the curriculum. That's wonderful. All right. Oh, sorry. Um, Sherry, did you want to speak on this topic as well? Well, um, I can only add that um, when we were doing our um, check-ins one day, one of the students added in there, I want you to know something about my family. And it was a very, very personal, um, long thing. And I thought that was really, really brave of this child to share that with me over a virtual classroom. So I set up a virtual meet with her and said, hey, I'm really pleased that you shared this with me. Thank you so much. And I think that just being compassionate and empathetic with them and doing whatever you have to do, whatever it comes up, is a very important thing to be able to talk about um, issues that um, are affecting them in the classroom. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for underscoring that. All right. So. Um, we want to, of course, be able to sustain these kinds of engagements. So I wanted to spend a, a little moment on going, you know, maybe beyond the first week or so of the year to how we kind of keep the momentum up. So Alice, let me take it away. Well, um, my, my advice is to shake it up whenever you can. Um, although I would preface that by saying the first thing we want to do is establish routines and ensure that the students know what the expectations are. And once that's established, um, make sure to include some fun and a little bit of joy all along the way. Um, I, I, I have a vivid memory of um, you know, facilitating projects with my students that uh, I, know, I know were challenging to them, but then trying to lighten it up whenever I could. And, and they did produce amazing work as a result. So this is one example where, um, this is the traditional assignment where you fold a piece of paper and you can do it either just as a random crumpling of paper or you can create an origami based fold system and then open it or leave it intact as whatever you've created with origami. And then you just sketch it with pencil on paper and you can discern all the slight subtleties of shadow and contrast and light. And so that was the project that then when we met live uh, we actually made, well, this was a student idea. Can we make baby Yodas with origami? I mean, I was going to show them how to make something sort of traditional and a student, you know, leave it to the students with their creative and all knowing minds said, can we do uh, baby Yoda? And so we did it together. Um, this student actually showed us how to do it. And this, I think this, you know, when you balance the, the, the focus on, um, learning new skills with moments like this, I think that's how you keep them coming back for more willingly. Absolutely, I love this. Um, one of the ways that I got them to do their assignments was telling them that they were going to be in an art show. And so it's just a PowerPoint or a Google Slides, whatever you want to call it. And we selected their works, the people that wanted to have their works into it. 
and we had three different slideshows this last spring. And they weren't just put on our school website, but they were actually put on the district website too. And the parents got involved with, oh, did you do your homework? Did you get that assignment done? I want to see your work up there next time. So um, keeping them excited about doing something was that kind of thing. And there are lots of different um, apps or things that you can use to have it look like an art gallery when you put your websites together too or art shows together. So there's lots of um, things like that. And I've forgotten the name of the one that we used for the um, AP show here, but um, you know, those kind of things keep them excited about doing their work. Yeah, I love that layer of authenticity, even though, you know, maybe you can't exhibit the works physically in, in the school, but there's still ways that you can do that and get them excited about it. Uh, we actually just launched our very own online student gallery at the Columbia Museum's website, so we're excited to hopefully get some of your students' work up there soon. All right. So this is not really new. I'm pretty much using Google Drive to display students' artwork. So we are using Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, but they don't have any function to display students' artworks there unless it's in the like discussion forum format. So what I did is that I just create a folder and then display students' artworks there, right? But then um, students do not have idea when their artworks will be displayed, so they have to be aware that it can be displayed at, at any time. So the quality um, seems to be better in that way. And uh, out of 100 students, they don't need to uh, critique others' works each week because if I do that, I mean, there will be too many, you know, comments there. So students can choose a few times throughout the semester to critique others' artworks, right? The good part of the Google Drive is that when you click the image, you, as you can see on the right side, you can select the section that you want to talk about it deeper. So they can select sections and they leave a comment about the section. And as other art teachers do, I ask them to choose three artworks, one your favorite, uh, one your interesting work, and then another one uh, that can be improved. Um, even though they're college students, they really are hesitant to leave anything for the improvement. They feel bad to say something to others' artworks. So I provide several examples of critique, you know, that's not really hurtful, but really just helps in terms of different media, different outline or thickness of outline. That simple, you know, like improvement. Um, with that, students tend to be uh, much more engaging and then really enjoy this critique as well. Nice, yeah. I like the idea of kind of doing it throughout. Okay, so I know many of you have questions about particular apps or websites or other um, resources that have been helpful. We have a lot of these in our Google Docs, so we're certainly not gonna touch on everything that's out there, but do um, feel free to reference that document now and later on. Um, but we just wanted to highlight a few that have been really successful in your classrooms. So this is, um, this is my slide. This is one of my students, Adobe Spark pages. So we took advantage of the fact that we are one-to-one -one iPad schools. We have a great camera on the iPad. You have a, a great photo editing app, all of that. And um, because they were home with iPads, I introduced photography and the work of specifically Steve McCurry, who is um, a photographer who's photographs for National Geographic. He has a beautiful website, including different collections that he posts periodically that are curated by theme or topic. What I love about his work is that he brings um, a, a complete geographic awareness where he's photographed all over the world, many times in many different countries. And so we studied his work as a group and we learned about photographic compositional elements while looking at his work together live in our live class. And then the students um, use their iPads to create, photo, to make photographs. And then there's that kind of that um, skill-based part where they had to identify certain compositional elements in each of their photos and submit that to me. But when they were finished with the photography, they created Adobe Spark pages. And then we took all those Spark pages, if you want to flip to the next slide, and put them up on a Padlet. So those are a couple of good, so this is a great way to present artwork. Um, in my school, we're also using Artsonia to present artwork. 
and um, to create. So just so here's here's an example of the Padlet with all the Spark pages. So you can share the link and then everybody can look at them. And it's just a great way to share that. But other apps we're using in class um, for creation, we're using Autodesk Sketchbook, which is free. We're using Tinkercad to create 3D models, and that's free. And we're also using Stop Motion Studio, which is also free. So yes, we have iPads, but we don't have a budget for apps. So I'm always using free, uh, free apps. And then presenting is hugely important too. And for that, we're using Padlet, we're using Adobe Spark page, and we're using Artsonia. So th that's just a short list of some of the many things we're able to do with iPads. Great. Oh yeah, this one is the, my uh, recommendation for uh, high school or uh, university students because I teach non-art major, so they don't have a lot of information about art. And what's great about this website, all the video is very simple, three to five minutes. And then so you can integrate this one as easily in your lesson because they don't have to very pay attention about the, you know long time. And also, uh, this one is interpreted by the art historian, the Bess Harris and Steve Joker, and they uh, visit actual uh, museum where the collection is. And then they uh, describe the work of art, but not just the historical facts, they reflect each other, like, oh, look at the color and something like that. They have sometimes argument and different opinion. So, and then they find the solution and they give idea about the history. So uh, I really love this website and they use it a lot for my uh, art appreciation course. And next one, this one is a uh, cartoon based uh, artist introduction. Even though I teach non-art major and big kid college students, they love because uh, I watch it together with the Haley Marcus. The video is very good. And then we also talk about the brown fish. And what's great about this one is the one uh, girl it has a prince, the, the, the Marty and Dada is actually uh, imagination, they make an adventure to visit great artists and then explain about their material and metal and process, their idea, and then uh, they also share about the work of art. So I love this uh, website. And also, if you want to, uh, if you're a teacher for kindergarten and younger elementary, this one is, so you can make they pay attention to the, this artist lesson. Usually seven minutes or eight minutes. Great, oh, wonderful. Well, as I said, we have a lot more resources in the Google Doc, so feel free to continue referencing that for, for lots more recommendations. And I put in here just a list that I made. Um, the Director of Fine Arts for our district asked me to put together a list this summer of some websites. And I don't know if you can make this pages added to the document or not, but this is just different things and there's three pages of it, of different um, websites that have art lessons and things that you can use at your fingertips. That's really important to have. And you may not use their exact lesson because I rarely do, but it sparks my um, ideas and it sparks my mind into going into different directions and I can customize it for what I do in my school. Oh, wonderful. Three slides. <laughs> well, I'll make sure all of this information uh, gets added into our Google Doc. So I'm just going to post these briefly, but rest assured, we'll, we'll make sure this all ends up in our resource document. And then this one is, uh, well, to give you a little background, Do Inc is an app I use in the classroom. And because I had used it all three um, quarters before this last quarter, the kids were like, are we not going to get to do the green screen technology? You know, can you hear the disappointment? And I said, well, we'll figure it out. And they have an animation and drawing part to the do link that you can use with them on their Chromebooks or on iPads or something like that. And when I first started doing do link, it was free. And I 
think there's a fee on it now, but I can't speak to that because I got it when it was free. So, but this is a really good app. We use it for our green screen technology. We use Kahinde Wiley um, lessons with the green screen and put them in front of the um, printed backgrounds that they make with patterns and things like that. And then we do critiquing with the green screen and they have on the smart board to one side, like you would a weather photographer, their landscape or their drawing and they have to point at it and do all that kind of thing to talk about where everything is and say like a landscape, the foreground, middle ground and background so they can critique it and show you what they did. So I like this um, app for the classroom and I like the part that they have for online learning. Wonderful. Okay, um, so since we're talking about a lot of these things, we're kind of translating from, you know, this, maybe it's this lesson you do every year um, or something that students look forward to, you know, how can we replicate those in different ways and what kind of STEAM components uh, specifically have you been able to incorporate? A lot, I know a lot of you have STEAM expertise for sure. Oh, this is, this is my um, photo and it reminds me to add about um, green screen technology if you're using iOS devices, iMovie now has a green screen component. So for this project, it's timely because this project is a uh, really a four-part project um, where students they were they were engaged in the design process, design thinking, and product development. And so they designed a creature to be made out of cardboard. You can see in the imagery that the top right shows the design and everything's labeled and the parts and with um, actually with attention to how the parts will join. So the way they connect connections and then also their, their design had to be able to be mobile. So they had to work in some kind of mobility factor. And then on the left, you can see the completed cardboard um, creature. And that's, this is created with a group of four and then the middle right is a green screen animation. So we used iMovie to do this where they made the animation. They actually were kind of hang, suspending the, um, the creature in front of a green screen and then making it go through its motions and recording that and then um, putting, it, putting it any kind of a background behind it using the green screen technology. And then the final part of this is 3D modeling using Tinkercad. So that's where it says 3D modeling. So you can see all, all four phases of this one project that I honestly probably took about uh, eight weeks, and, well, maybe six weeks. And we were, we were working on this um, pretty, for a long time, but it, is, it does bring in many phases of um, instruction as well as skills. And the kids were engaged all the way through because they were working with something they loved, which was their cardboard creature. Nice. And I love that it incorporates really simple, you know, found object kind of materials that they might have at home too. So that's a nice yeah. one. <laughs> right. And then this, um, this slide is also mine. This is actually our art show, which I used an app called ThingLink. It's actually a, a web-based platform that you can log on to with a mobile device or your laptop. And um, if you click on each, each one of those targets, it'll bring you to my blog, which is Mona Lisa lives here taught me and um, e each one of those items that you see is a different project that this became our art show and so there are there are also groupings on Padlet and other forms um, for instance Artsonia so the little targets will link you to that exhibit on Artsonia so I want to recommend ThingLink as a great way to include some um, some technology into your work and also to make an art show but this year I look forward to going to museums virtually with my students to art museums and looking at collections and then having them curate a collection. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, facilitate their use of ThingLink to curate a collection within a gallery. Great, I love that. One of the ways that, um, like you're talking Alice, is to bring that design thinking process in and being able to teach them the steps of the design thinking is an important part. And we do this by starting with very simple projects and then we um, move it on into more advanced projects. I love your project. I may have to swipe that from you. 
Um, this particular um, process is our um, design proficiency standards from the state of South Carolina is where this comes from. And as you can see on the right, the steps can go in many different directions. You don't have to go in a circular pattern that you might think of. You don't have to go from step one to step two. You can go mm -hmm. from step one to step three and then back to step two to go to research. And teaching them this in any art project, I think is a very good way. This year, if we're going to be on um, A day, B day, on their, on their not in school day, they're, I'm going to use collaboration over their devices as a way to get them working with each other, even when they're at home. So they will be working on these projects after they've been introduced in class. Great. That's great. We can still collaborate even if we're working remotely. So as a STEAM project, I wanted to introduce Bleep Bar. So Bleep Bar is a free website to create the uh, augmented reality app. And then um, you also need to download the app uh, to scan the image. So what I did is that I did a traditional painting. As you can see, my students drawing on the right side, they um, drew or painted endangered species first. And then what they do is that they go to Bleep Bar website and then um, try to embed information to their painting, if that makes sense. So um, because it's endangered species, they had to research a lot about the species and they put the map where they uh, live and then the characteristics of them, related video, related website. So they could embed a lot of um, images, text and videos by using the website. And then once they can, uh, they scan the um, painting on their app, the layer of information pops up as augmented reality. So um, I can share the step-by-step -step, uh, document that I created. So according to the document, about half of students could do it, about half of students could not make their um, the app works. I don't know why. So they could work on the you know the information part, but then it wasn't like published uh, on their app for some reason. So that's the uh, minus part of it. But then about half really worked, and then once the technology works, it's a really fun project that students really liked. Yeah, I love this. I'm gonna have to explore Flipper. It sounds mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, before I explain about the STEAM lesson, what uh, my student did, I would like to introduce about if, do you know about this book? Because actually this one is the uh, collection of the STEAM lesson from old school uh, art. And then we actually plan to publish this one at 2020 NAA Minister, but it's cancer. So you publish this one. And when you look at this one, and there is a 32 lesson, but each lesson includes the objective and question and material lessons and also national standards for art and the collaborating STEAM lesson, like a science, math, technology, engineer. And then also give a step-by-step -step image and product. So this one is a good example as you use as a lesson plan and develop with the project. So I'd like to share this one is really uh, simple and uh, also there is a lot of difference uh, STEM lesson. 32 lesson is there. And this one is I just found from the Amazon and then purchased this one because I was looking for some very simple activity we can do uh, with a uh, student and there is a hundred is a steam activity right so you can see there is many difference so if you are teaching elementary school you can just uh get an idea but make your own and then you can use that one as the resource and next one and this one is a one steam lesson because my student student pre-service teacher they have to go student teaching, but this case is very hard. So they are uh, actually make a STEAM lesson. It's a virtual class and one of the students, they uh, combine uh, hand-drawn painting, right? So you can see that uh, the process with the cup, recycled cup and wire, and they use the, wall, the, the principle. And it also incorporate with the contemporary artists. You can see that the, the idea about how we can make the STEM lesson for kids can do in the home. 
Yeah, um, it's wonderful because all of these resources and examples, I feel like, have had a piece of you know recycled materials or repurposed objects, and so you're clearly you've all already been starting to think this way. Um, but our next question really ties into that, which is so many of you have had this question, which is just how do you adapt your lessons or just you know be mindful of your students' perhaps lack of materials at home. Um, and just addressing that notion of equity in terms of, you know, what's available to some students but may not be available to others in terms of materials, but, but other things as well. Oh, this is, um, this is from a project that my students did when they were home this spring, using found materials around the home, in nature, you know, in the kitchen, wherever. And it's based, um, full credit goes to Professor um, Chuck Stigliano from Massachusetts College of Art. I happen to see him post a couple of things that his 3D students did at MassArt when they were working remotely. And he posted them on Twitter and I immediately fell in love with the chickens because at my home we had just um, received eight chicks like a few days before. So my, my home and small farm was all about the chicks right then. And so I think that's why I gravitated towards um, the chicken. But I, you know, I basically took exactly what he had done and just kind of made it more appropriate for ages 10, 11, and 12 rather than college stage. And it was basically make a chicken using any materials you have at home. And they were very few creative constraints except to make a chicken. And um, this is this is also up on my blog and you can see in detail some of these phenomenal chickens. So the students um, made the chicken and then they photographed it and then they added their name using the markup tools and the camera app and um, submitted it to Google Classroom. And we had such a great time looking at these in our live class sessions. I mean, you would, you might call it a critique, but really it was just so joyous that, you know, this whole chicken idea was so joyous for us when we were spending time together live. So this was a, you could do anything with found objects on a theme and that, um, that will probably be very successful. And you'll also be amazed. I mean, I saw pancake chickens and chickens made out of rice and chickens made out of cardboard boxes. And oh, it's just, it was great. I love that um, flexibility and freedom and just, you know, embracing those um, different creative ideas. Uh, it was wonderful. wonderful. Um, I want to say, and I didn't have a slide to put in here about this, but our kids left school on a Friday and we went virtual on a Monday and a lot of them leave their materials in their desk, like their colored pencils or their scissors because they stay at school. So my kids didn't all have, some of them had a piece of paper and a pencil and that was all they had. So I, I collected together some sets of uh, colored pencils, just a basic set, and I put it out on the website. Anybody that needed you know, colored pencils to do their artwork at home, I would take it to them. And so I made deliveries in a plastic bag and hung it on their doorknob and left it there and told them that it was there and took these kids, especially the ones that just don't have the extra money to go out and get another set of something. I wanted to make sure that we had materials at home that they could work with and something just as simple as a colored pencil. So that was one way that we made sure they had things at home to work with. Well, I'm sure that was appreciated. Um, I know we're coming close up on our time, but I want to see um, if we can just get to a couple more of our questions because they were so timely. And I know many of you had this question particularly. Um, how do you address, I mean, this goes right along with materials, but those um, particular, um, you know, maybe higher level usually, or just, you know, more involved um, art activities that require different kinds of equipment. Um, how have you kind of made that work, especially thinking about ceramics or other kind of 3D instruction? Okay, uh, I think for at this time, you have to think about alternative way students can make with low cost 
because we are not able to offer the old material together. And our school, we have certain hours students can visit the auto room and then they can use material and they grab the material. So we made that policy. And this one is one of the photography lesson because we teach photography, sculpture, architecture, but we cannot actually experience any photography. And this one is the lesson plan I put and then some art paper kit was the $6 in Amazon. It's a very small size. And uh, so students purchased that one and then they made study about some art and then make their art well. So that's the one of the alternate way we can uh, teach or experience their uh, photography lesson. I think a lot of teachers also uh, teaching in high school, they probably teach this lesson before. And next one is the, uh, uh, this one is the sculpture. Actually, I teach big size of the class, but in the classroom, we do study about relief and pre-standing sculpture, right? So they use all different material to make their own because university, we don't have to offer every material and they purchase their own material. But this one is, uh, we are in home and they, uh, I ask because there is an old, you know, recycled magazine because I have tons of recycled magazine because I don't want to waste my uh, airline, the mileage reverse. So I use the uh, magazine a lot. And this one is a student walk. Uh, they uh, use the relief and pre-standing, but I'm not sure if they'll actually make their own. So when you look at the next slide, they have to put process and product and they have to explain about briefly because I don't trust the product who made that one. It's good if I can trust, but so they explain about process and product and they require two pictures. And next one is the next slide. And also I made a room because we cannot officially display uh, like right side, that's the display. We display uh, in the classroom the left one is the online display because the student can open and they can see their uh, peer work of art. And student, some students uh, submit earlier. So some other students can get idea from other peers as well. Like how can make it and what kinds of the uh, work of art they have. So I, uh, and then they can also make the comments, like I like your wall and it's good and it's cool, something like that, right? So this one is last semester because in March, middle of the March we left and then April we had to change. At the time I have lesson, uh, sculpture, architecture. So it's kind of very hard and then we find the uh, alternative way to make the low cost material. I think that's the founded object. Yeah, uh, the magazine sculptures are really stunning. Mm. Uh, one question that we've gotten quite a bit um, is actually about uh, assessment. And so, you know, how do you then, you know, move from, you know, this technique and process to thinking about things like grading? Um, and we also got some questions about sort of differentiating instruction as well. So um, maybe we can speak to both in a small way with our limited time. is my, this is um, a snapshot of Google Classroom, one of the projects um, work turned in. I think this is the Make a Chicken project actually. And um, about assessment, I developed a routine early on where um, all our work was due on Friday and that was a school-based decision. So all, all schoolwork was due on Friday. So on Monday morning, I would look in Google Classroom, which is one reason I, I do really enjoy Google Classroom. And I can see immediately how many kids have turned it in, how many students haven't yet. And then um, there was one apparently that I returned, I don't know why. But um, you can see that right away. And so I would reach out and another feature of Google Classroom is you can actually select the whole row of kids who have turned it in and you can send them an email right through Google Classroom saying, I would say to them, I'm so glad you're keeping up with your schoolwork. I can't wait to take a closer look at this. I'll get back to you in the middle of the week with some feedback. So then you can delay your feedback and make it really meaningful. Whereas the kids who haven't yet turned it in, they would receive a different email that says, I, you know, I noticed you haven't turned it in. Um, 
is there anything going on? What can I do to help you? You know, things like that. So for assessment, like letting them know right away that it matters, that you're looking and that you appreciate their being timely um, is a big help. And then to come back later with feedback in the comments or via a Zoom session is a great way to provide that personal assessment. Yeah, that um, seems like a godsend to have something that kind of organizes all of that for you. And I imagine that would be um, really helpful for like many our teachers, those who have lots of different students and lots of classes. Um, so, so that's a great resource. Yeah, that's a pretty new feature on Google Classroom to be able to sort by whether it's turned in or not, and then just click that top X, it selects all the ones who are turned in, and then it'll basically start an email for you, so. Great. Um, we did get a question that came in about um, differentiating instruction and thinking about accessibility um, in terms of students with special needs or um, who might need different, you know, just a differentiated instruction, whatever that looks like. Um, and this will tie into our next question, but uh, I do have some resources I've come across that are particularly helpful for students with low vision in terms of museum resources and virtual tour options that you can find online. But I wanted to um, kind of open it up to our panelists as well if you had any thoughts on differentiating or maybe even facilitating student choice or what that looks like in a virtual realm. I have had students with low vision before, and it is very important with the um, Google Slides or any kind of production like that, that I take into that consideration of whether or not they can see things by following those ADA guidelines. And I try to do that with all the things that I present, either online with Google Classroom or in um, the actual physical classroom, because I can't, I tend to get too carried away with decorative stuff on the slides and the simplicity of it helps them to have a better opportunity in the room. And so that's one thing I try to be very mindful of when I'm doing that. And to differentiate, um, one of the reasons I use an essential question that is very open-ended is because there is many different ways to solve an art problem. And so when you, the difference would be like between let's make a cake like Wayne Tebow's cake or what would you like to eat after dinner project opens up the creativity. And when you do that, it differentiates the lesson. Nice, yeah, great reminders there, I think. All right. Um, I would just reiterate that choice is, is essential with our broad array of students. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and Sherry, I think this is your um, assessment uh, as well. Right? My spring birds lesson, I've taught for zillions of years and it translated very well onto the platform because I already had all the um, bird um, pictures already scanned into a PowerPoint. And then on the side, you can see, I just use the Google feature of a rubric. And because we can only give three grades, ES and N in elementary, it was really easy to make these rubrics. And I try to make it where they can understand and it's about what they can do, not about what I'm grading. And uh, so it's more about that. And this is a picture of one of them. So, and then with the Google um, rubrics, it will upload on a spreadsheet and put it right into PowerSchool. So it makes it really fluid. Yeah, that's great to know the rubrics are embedded right there within the program. Wonderful. All right, we have limited time, but I did wanna briefly touch on some outside resources that you have found helpful in your work from museums and other kinds of um, places that have can share images and have those kinds of uh, opportunities for your students. So I'll turn it to you again, Sherry. Okay, well, I wanna just say first, always go to your local museum, like the Columbia Museum of Art, because they always have great programs and have for years and years. And I'm sure that the museums around you have the same kinds of um, activities and things that you can access. But I, um, at the beginning, myself and another art teacher, we just Googled um, what are the um, museum virtual tours? And we came up with this website, which was 17 famous art museums you can visit in your living room. And it is particularly a family friendly one, which is important. And I put in here this caution to always make sure that you view the tour to make sure it's appropriate for your school district. 
And, um, you know, with fifth and sixth graders, we're not into doing any nudes just yet. So we have to be very careful about that. But this gives them that ability to do that. And the other thing I do with um, an artwork or something is I might find a particular artist that's got a really good um, video on their particular art style and put that in here too. And they enjoyed those too. Wonderful. Yeah, um, I'm glad to hear you shout out local museums. Um, probably the museums in your area, wherever you are, are doing, um, are creating materials that are adapted to your particular state standards, as well as, you know, the strengths of their collection. So hopefully you'll explore what's in your own backyard as well. And I did throw in a little shout out to um, our own work that we're doing right now. We've got a few different options. We, of course, usually have lots of in-person field trips and this year, probably not so much. Um, but we've been working hard on a menu of virtual field trip options that uh, we hope will allow for different types of um, students to engage. So that um, runs the gamut from, you know, image sets and lesson plans that you can download for free and use in your classrooms. Those are all just images uh, that come from our collection and Word documents, um, lesson plans that you can adapt as you need to. Uh, we offer asynchronous uh, tours in the form of a voice thread, which works with a lot of different LMS platforms. And then we're working on some pre-recorded um, in-gallery video tours. And we'll have some live virtual discussions as well that will be facilitated by um, educators like myself or our docents. Um, so just wanted to throw a little shout out um, to the work we're doing at, at the Columbia Museum of Art. But there are certainly no shortage of museums out there doing wonderful work. Um, so please do look at those resources in the, in the Google Doc. All right, and then to kind of wrap it all up, I know we've run a little bit over and I'm sorry for that, um, but there were a number of you who asked about um, first time or first year teachers. And we wanted to just leave you with some words of wisdom and encouragement as you face this uh, rather unusual school year. So Sherry, take it away. Uh, uh, my advice for first year teachers is um, things are going to look upside down, just like you see. This is a picture of my sister and one of her workmates, and they're in an upside down room. But just remember, all things shall pass, and what was the norm before may never be again, but it will be a new norm, and we will enjoy it just as much. I want the first year teachers to know that they are prepared. We've got People like Dr. Chang and Dr. Kwan, they have prepared you very, very well and you will be okay. Number one thing you need to do is establish a, men a mentor relationship, somebody you can trust, somebody that is not evaluating you, somebody that can do that. Have fun with the kids every day. Remember that whether they're high school or kindergarten, they're all there and they all appreciate you being there and that they're there to learn and you're there to help them learn. Don't forget to breathe. Breathing's important, so take time to do that. Communicate to the students constantly, let them know that you're on their side. And lastly, take time for yourself. Go kayaking, go for a walk, do whatever it is that you like to do, because you've got this. Very nice. Well. I think uh, we'll, we'll end it there on that note. Um, thank you all so much um, for participating and especially thank you to our panelists. We are so grateful and um, appreciative of you spending your time with us today and uh, sharing your expertise and all of those wonderful resources. So thank you um, to Yinjung, Sherry, Hyunji, and Alice. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of you, all of you educators out there for just showing up for your students, um, for being teachers. Uh, we, we know how critical your work is in your uh, communities. You're building resilient and resourceful students who will, will in turn shape their own communities. So thank you for that important work that you do every day. Uh, we hope you'll join us for another discussion this Thursday at two. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of the technical aspects of digital learning. We'll also dig into some of the other questions you had that we didn't get into, things like grading um, and maybe some of the more um, you know, logistical aspects of what those look like. Um, so again, that's Thursday at two. You can find all that information more at columbiamuseum.org slash learn. Um, and we will also be sending out a link for a survey just to tell us um, 
what your feedback was on this session. We'd love to hear that so we can continue to offer these and other sessions for, for you and, and teachers like you. So until then, thank you all so much. Thank you again to our panelists and goodbye from the Columbia Museum of Art. <laughs>